this is the final webinar in our five-part series on breeding better sheep and goats. The topic for tonight is advanced genetic improvement. My name is Susan Shanian. I'm the sheep and goat specialist for University of Maryland Extension. Jeff Semler will be answering questions in the chat box. Jeff did the second webinar on breeding systems. Jeff is a county extension agent here in Washington County, Maryland, which is the same county where our research center is located. I mentioned earlier before we got started that I enjoyed putting this presentation together because genetics is something that's always interested me. There is a lot going on that we can utilize. There's also a lot going on that you kind of hope is going to be available in the future. And I'll be the first one to say that a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight may not be applicable to a lot of us. Because a lot of this stuff favors larger flocks. Even favors countries that have much larger uh, national flocks and herds. Genetics is about probabilities. It's about predictions. So it's very numbers oriented. And so the more numbers we have, the better the data gets, the better the ability to predict. Some of this stuff we certainly can take advantage of right now. And I'll talk about how, how maybe a small flock owner is what some of these things that, that we can do. I basically want to talk about two things tonight. Two, Two things of what I would categorize as advanced genetic improvement. The first, and I'll probably spend more time on this, is what I would call a cross-flock genetic evaluation. Basically, what I'm talking about here are national performance record-keeping programs. Most countries that have large industries, most developed countries, have some sort of national performance evaluation program for different species of livestock. And by a cross flock, what we mean is we can compare the sheep or goats on your farm to the sheep or goats on another farm in another state that are raised in a very different manner. You can compare the animals on your own farm. You can determine which animals on your own farm are genetically superior. You can do that by doing the on-farm record keeping and evaluation that we talked about last week. Adjusted weaning weights, adjusted post weaning weights. You can select for parasite resistance within your own flock or herd. With the important thing being keeping still making sure, even on your own farm, that you compare apples to apples and that you only compare animals in the same contemporary group. If you consign a buck or ram to a performance test, a central performance test, much like we do at our research center, you are able to compare your buck or ram to a buck or ram from another farm because while they aren't the same contemporary group when they get there, the very nature of a performance test is to then equalize the environment so that they are in the same contemporary group and can be compared. The limitation, much like the limitation to your on-farm performance evaluation, is you basically got data from that individual animal. You don't have any data from other relatives. So you still have a, a very limited ability to select the genetically superior animals. Today we're going to talk about the national performance record program that we have for meat and fiber animals. And then also this country we have it for dairy animals. The second thing I want to talk about, and to me the one that, that fascinates me, I consider it primarily futuristic although there are some components to it that we can all use, and that's basically genomics, marker-assisted selection, 
you know, genotyping, you know, mapping, all, lots of different terms. But where we're really trying to get at the genetics from a, a molecular level. And there's basically, this is a very complex topic and, and well above my pay grade. But we'll talk about some, some basic concepts. And basically when we look at using the, the genome uh, to make selection decisions and to make genetic improvement, we kind of split traits, two groups of traits. The first group and the one that we've made the greatest progress on, because it's the easiest, are traits that are controlled by a single gene or if they're controlled by more than one gene, uh, it's less than 10 and there's genes that have major effects on the trait. And we'll talk about what, you know, what some of these traits are. And then there's the second one, the complex quantitative traits, kind of the ones that tend to be much more economically important to us. You know, we want to make animals grow faster. We want to make them have bigger ribeyes. We want to make them be more resistant to diseases. Most of those traits are very complex. And as a result, they're much more challenging, even from a DNA or genomic or gene mapping standpoint. So let's talk about the, the uh, across flock evaluations, the national record keeping programs. In this country, we have what's called the National Sheep Improvement Program, NSIP is what people will call it. It was established in 1986, so that's over 25 years ago. The purpose was to help producers who were keeping records to do something useful with these records, put them in a usable form where we could the producers could make decisions and make genetic improvements similar to what had been occurring in, in the dairy industry, in, in the beef industry, in the swine industry. So it was set up that you would fill, put your data in a spreadsheet, the data that we talked about last week that you would keep on the farm, you know, birthing records, uh, weaning weights, fleece weights, things like that. You would send that data to a breed coordinator. Each breed that participated in NSIP had a, a coordinator. So if you were a Suffolk breeder, there'd be a, you send it to the coordinator for the Suffolk breed, okay, or the Katahdin breed. They would compile that data and kind of into one big file, and they would send it to Virginia Tech for processing. Uh, Dave Nodder at Virginia Tech, who's an animal breeder, now retired, he took the leadership in the National Sheep Improvement Program, and that's where the data was processed. Very complex software, mainframe computers were used to calculate EPDs both within the flock, where you can compare your own animals in the flock, and then more importantly, the across flock EPDs. And I'll talk about what an EPD is in just a few minutes. So this has been going on for about 25 years. A couple of years ago, and I don't know if it's um, because Dave Nodder was going to retire, probably more importantly, the funding wasn't really solid the NSIP program entered into a cooperative agreement with Meat and Livestock Australia, basically the trade organization for the Australian sheep and goat industry. They had a national performance evaluation program called Lamb Plan. They also have one called Kid Plan. But anyhow, the, the NSIP entered into an agreement with Lamb Plan so that the data is now being processed in Australia by land plant. It doesn't really matter that it's in Australia because everything is done over the internet. You still work through NSIP. We still have court we still have a coordinator for that. And you and you, we don't have so much breed coordinators anymore, but we, you still would send your stuff through NSIP. Now land plan calculates calcul calculates e, what's called an EBV an estimated breeding value. And again, I'm going to go over what some of these things are. NSIP calculated the EPD, and we're going to differentiate what those are. If you'd like to learn more about land plan, think about this is the country that has, a, well, I used to say they used to have the most sheep in the world. Now China does. But they're certainly the uh, most sophisticated sheep and goat industry in the world, along with New Zealand. And you can learn more about Lamb Plan. They have one for Merinos, and they also have the Kid Plan. And you can learn a lot just by visiting their website. And there's the URL right there. Okay, so what does all these terms mean? Okay, EPD, the acronym is Expected 
progeny difference. What EPDs did was they evaluated the genetic value of an animal as a parent. So what an EPD was doing, it, it was predicting the performance of the future offspring. So if a ram had an EPD of 1, that means we were expecting his progeny would have that, that's how much superior they'd be than, to the average of their breed. So this was looking at the parent. Lamb plan calculates the EBV, which stands for estimated breeding value. This value is predicting the performance of the individual as that individual compares to, the, to whatever benchmark you're comparing it to, the average for the breed. So this is the individual. So if you look at them very simplistically, two EPDs equals one EBV, or vice versa, because one's the parent, and you have two parents, and one's the individual. So hopefully that makes sense. We no longer in this country calculate or get EPDs. That was under the old system. Now that we're with lamb plan, and this would include meat goats as well, we now get EBV. And keep in mind, the whole point of these national evaluation programs is to estimate the genetic value of an animal. To estimate the genetic value of an animal. An important component of all of this is accuracy. How reliable is that EPD, or, or nowadays, that EBV? How likely, if we collect more data, is that EBV to go up and down? How accurate it is? And obviously, the closer that is to 100, the better. Because at 100, and we don't get accuracies of 100, but that would actually be the animal's true breeding value. You know, notice the terms, expected and estimated. We're not saying we guarantee that's what these animals are. We're predicting it. And so the higher the accuracy, the closer we are to predicting the animal's true breeding value. The information that's used to calculate these breeding values obviously is the animal's own performance for a particular trait. His weight gain, his um, birth type, his, his fecal egg count. Just like the on-farm performance evaluation, that data is first adjusted for the known environmental effects. It's, it's weaning weights birth weights. They're adjusted for type of birth and rearing, the age of the dam, so the same adjustments are made. This is where most of us, again with our on-farm record keeping or even our buck test, this is where we stop. We only have the animal's own individual performance. So if you think of that idea of accuracy, our accuracy would be way, way down, very low because it's the data from simply one animal. What these computer programs and the software does is it incorporates the animal's performance in other traits that are genetically related to the trait that we're looking at. It also takes into account the performance of the relatives of that animal. And so the more data we have, the higher that accuracy figure gets and again, the closer we get to that true breeding value. I always tell people when they buy a buck from our buck test, if he's got low fecal egg counts, nine of them, he's probably himself a very, a, a definitely a resistant buck. But his ability to transmit that trait is not going to be, I'm not going to say it's not going to be not, it's not high, it's just it's going to be very variable because, again, we only have the data from the one buck. Now, say a consigner brought five bucks and they were all out of the same sire and they all had good fecal egg counts. 
while I wouldn't have the computer software to back, back it up, I would feel more confident buying one of those bucks because it would be that kind of data, you know, other siblings, half-brothers, maybe even a full brother in there that had similar data. And it's that type of data that would make that accuracy more powerful if it was part of one of these um, performance evaluation programs. But this, this, these programs allow us to, to take all this data from the related traits and from the related animals and build a stronger case for being able to predict the genetic transmitting ability of that individual. Again, the, what's powerful is the opportunity to compare animals across flocks, across herds, across locations. This slide shows pictures of three very different Katahdin operations, Katahdin ewes. The first one was actually in Mexico. They're all being raised in confinement. They're never on pasture. All the feed is brought to them. And then you've got uh, the one in the middle was kind of, I'm going to say, a hybrid operation. And the one on the right was, was predominantly pasture-based. Well, the more you feed, you're going to expect to get heavier weaning weights, things like that. And you're going to say, well, that, you know, what's this going to tell me? The whole idea is that these across-flock breeding values take out the environmental effects. They take them out. So it doesn't matter where the lambs are being raised. It doesn't matter how they're being fed. It doesn't matter how they're being managed. It takes out those environmental effects. We say, how does that do that? I could be flippant and say it's magic. But in order for these across flocks comparisons to be made, and they're even gonna, they even make them sometimes across breed, is we have to have genetics that are interrelated and connected. For example, in each of these flocks using the same ram, uh, probably what's going to more likely happen in each of these flocks, we would use a son of a particular ram. So these flocks need to have genetic connections. And people that are committed to being in these programs really are making a commitment to kind of work together. They have to be dedicated not only to improving their own genetics, but improving their breed. Improving their breed. And so they share genetics. They buy each other's rams. They buy each other's bucks. They support each other. They don't go out and buy a ram out of a flock that's not in NSIP because we need those interconnections. When those connections don't exist, your accuracy values will be extremely low and at a certain number, and I don't remember exactly what the number is, the system will not calculate across flock breeding values. It will calculate within flock or flock breeding values. So if you simply wanted to join this program to compare the old animals in your flock, being a little bit more sophisticated than what you can do on, on in a spreadsheet yourself, you would still get EPDs. It's just they would be your own flock. And they would still be extremely valuable to helping you make selection decisions for your own flock. But to get across flock and to contribute to breed improvement, we need to have the interconnections of all the different flocks. Artificial insemination is a good tool. Uh, it's probably why the dairy industry, or one of the dairy reasons the dairy industry has been so successful at, at, at making genetic progress. In the sheep industry, it's not really a viable option. Uh, certainly it is in the goat industry. But um, again, you, the main thing is to have these, these flocks and herds connected to each other genetically. I'm going to go through um, some of the traits that NSIP and Land Plan look at and that you could actually track and evaluate. And keep in mind if you're a breeder and you're not going to participate in one of these programs for whatever reasons, it doesn't mean that you can't use and benefit from these programs. You need a new Katahdin ram for your flock? Buy one with NSIP data. 
Just don't go down the road and buy one because you like how he looks. Uh, buy from a flock that has NSIP data and buy the kind of ram that has the, the traits, the genetics that you're looking for. Obviously, we do a lot of measurements with, with weight uh, in meat animals, uh, also with fiber animals because they tend to be dual purpose. Dairy animals, at least on the sheep side, tend to be dual purpose. So we look at birth weight. They look at the direct genetic effects of, of uh, birth weight. Then they have what's called a maternal birth weight. What's the female's influence on birth weight? Particularly what type of uterine environment does she create? Weaning weight. If you were to ask me what's the most important trait in meat, sheep, and meat production, it's, it's weaning weight. That's the trait that makes you money. In NSIP, we had a trait called maternal milk. Number four is lamb plans equivalent, what they call a maternal weaning weight. And it's kind of a calculated, I mean, all of them are calculated, but then it's a calculated trait. Um, and total maternal weaning weight is looking at, is looking at uh, weaning weight plus that maternal milk. And I, as a, for example, as a cotton breeder who believes that my breed greatest asset is the maternal side, and I probably feel the same way if I had a breed like polypay or Finn, that number four would be very important to me, maternal milk. Some more weight traits. If I'm a terminal sire breeder, a Suffolk breeder, a Texel breeder, that post weaning weight, typically a 120 day weight, is going to be very important to me because I'm going to want that post weaning growth. That pre weaning growth has a lot to do with the influence of the dam. The post weaning growth uh, has a lot of influence to do with the sire. So this is a very important trait from, for our terminal sire breeds. Yearling weight, this tends to be a real important weight for our range uh, sheep producers out west. Hoggett weight, that's kind of a, a Australian or European term. Basically it's a yearling in, in that she's about a, a year and a half old. Our yearling weight we think of as 12 months, so this is about a year and a half. And then they will also do breeding values for adult body weights at all different ages, you know, two, three, four, five, however you want to do it. So this is the array of weight traits that they do. If we look at the wool traits, and, and you can imagine in Australia the wool traits are extremely important. And I look at a lot of our folks that you don't grow commodity white fine wool, but that doesn't mean these traits aren't also important for some of our niche markets. Obviously the most uh, significant ones from a commercial standpoint would be things like fleece weight, fiber diameter and staple length. The fiber diameter coefficient of variation is looking for the uniformity in that fleece. Number five is crimp, clean fleece weight, staple, length, staple strength. These are all different traits that we can look at in terms of wool production. Catered primarily, again, to the commodity market, but also traits that are important for our niche markets. Body composition traits. Uh, these traits can be universally important for a lot of breeds, but have particular importance for our terminal sire breeds, Suffolk, Hampshire, Texel, Southdown. If I'm a boar goat or a meat goat breeder, these traits might also be, would be important to me. These are traits that are determined by ultrasound. Uh, they have to be done by a certified technician. We scan our goats at, at our buck test, so we're doing these types of traits. But again, our buck tests were limited to the single data on that buck. Here we're going to get, as we build that data and build all those relatives, all those related traits in, we're going to have much more accurate system for predicting the genetic merit of that animal for that trait. Fat depth, how much back fat between the 12th and 13th rib. Uh, in a lot of cases it's going to be done on the lamb. They'll adjust it to 110 pounds. If it's done as a yearling, again this might be more of a wool type or range sheep. They adjust it to a 
a different weight. Again, it's very important that certain traits be adjusted. Just like if you were doing your own on-farm evaluation and you brought a technician in to ultrasound yours, you would want to adjust them to a common weight. Loin eye muscle depth. Typically in this country we've scanned to determine the um, area, the whole area of the ribeye, but what's common in the rest of the world and is common with lamb plan is you're looking at just the depth, the depth of the loin. And again, they're adjusted to those weights, kind of depending on the breed and the production system. Because obviously it's important that when you're looking at a whole variety of traits that you actually record that data at the right time and that there's flexibility built into the system for different breeds and different production systems. But these two are very important traits and if you look worldwide, I would say they're becoming even more important, not just for our terminal sire breeds, but even trying to have some components of these in selection indexes. For reproductive traits, uh, there's one for obviously number of lambs born and number of lambs weaned or kids. And then from the male side of a reproductive trait, you can measure scrotal circumference. Again, we do this at the buck test, but I just have the data on the one buck. To me, as a, as a, as a again, as a Katahdin breeder, as, a, as a, ma a maternal breed, these traits would be very important to me, if I want, especially if I want to increase productivity. I would put a heavy emphasis on lumber lambs born or weaned, depending on, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm in a, a fairly intense management system, I might be interested in more number lambs born with the assumption of maybe I'm going to be there to, to, to save more of them. If I'm in a more extensive production system, I'd probably be more interested in number of lambs weaned. Parasite resistance. Fecal egg counts or worm egg counts. These are, uh, in lamb plan, they're done as a percentage not an egg count itself, not say 200 eggs or 300 eggs, but they're done as a percentage improvement from the average. You know, again, our bucks, I have nine egg counts, but it's just that one buck. And uh, here we're going to incorporate related traits, we're going to incorporate other relatives, and we're going to increase the accuracy. Again, very important when you collect this data. It's typically done at weaning or um, some point past weaning. It's done when, they're, when the, you've removed the maternal influence, but before they've basically developed immunity as a mature animal. Now, you can continue to collect these at later times, but typically they're done when they're a lamb. NSIP, before it switched over to lamb plan, had started to do this for the Katahdin breed. Each breed kind of was selecting the traits that were important. Because again, breeds have different roles in the industry and what I might select a Suffolk ram for is going to be very different than what I might select a Katahdin ram for. So all these traits, what does it all mean? Well, as a breeder, you would get back a report that would give you breeding values for these different traits. This first table basically provides breeding values. The first one is birth weight. The second one is uh, maternal weaning weight, weaning weight, post weaning weight, and yearling weight. Below the estimated breeding value is the accuracy. And again, as close to 100 as possible. And so you can see the most, the trait with the most accuracy is actually post weaning. So that 9.8 is closer to the true breeding value than any other trait up there. So what does all this stuff mean? So birth weight has an estimated breeding value of 0.28 kilograms. And yes, it's Australia, so it's the metric system. Basically, a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So it would be a bigger number if it was in, in pounds. So what this data is showing is compared to a ram with an estimated breeding value of zero, 
Think of this data as a ram's data. So the average for that breed is zero. This ram's progeny, this lamb's offspring, this lamb's, ram's lambs, they're going to be 0.14 kilograms heavier at birth. They're going to sire daughters that wean 0.7 kilograms more. The offspring are going to be 3.2 kilograms heavier. Again, that's going to be a little over 7 pounds. They're going to be about 12 pounds heavier at post weaning and about 7 pounds heavier as yearlings. That's what that data means on that ram with those breeding values. Why do we cut them in half? Because again, there's two parents. There's two parents. This next table is looking at the same thing, only the traits this time are the reproductive traits. The first one's number of lambs born, number of lambs weaned, and scrotal circumference. So this ram has a, for number born, he has a breeding value of 2%. That means his daughters are going to produce 1% more lamb. They're going to wean 1.5% more lambs. And their scrotal circumference is going to be 0.6 centimeters greater. Multiply that by 2.5 and, and you'll get inches. You notice that the accuracy figures are, much, are not much lower, but are lower. Reproductive traits, we don't tend to get as high accuracy. They're harder to measure. In particular, they have much lower heritabilities. Now you think 1% more lambs. That doesn't sound like a lot. But then start thinking about generations and years. And then it really starts to make a difference. And genetics is long-term commitment. It's a long-term commitment. Crossbreeding can get instantaneous results. Making genetic improvements to a breed or to a closed flock, it's a commitment in time. It works, but it takes time, especially with traits that are harder to measure, reproductive traits, and have a lower heritability. Again, reproductive traits. Scrotal circumference has a pretty decent heritability, if you recall, about 35%, but reproductive traits are down about 10%. This last table basically is an EBV for worm egg count. And this RAM has a value of minus 20%, or minus 20, and that's 20%. 60% accuracy. Fecal egg count is a moderately heritable trait, about 0.25. So compared to, again, the average RAM, this RAM's prodigy are going to be 10% more resistant at weaning. Again, compile that over years. Compile that over generations. Don't keep using the RAM generation after generation. Replace them with the better one. You will make genetic progress. What the organizers, LAM plan, NSIP, will do with the data, and this is a particularly useful for those of us who don't participate in NSIP but maybe need to buy a new RAM, or buy some use to start with, is they will print sire summaries. You know, what are the, um, which rams lead in certain traits? And then you could say, well, you know, I want to get uh, one of the best rams, and this happens to be maternal. U.S., the United States classifies breeds according to maternal wool, hair sheep, terminal sire, and wool. Or wool maternal. Wool maternal, maternal, something like that. Anyhow, this is USA maternals. I would think of a breed like polypay. And WWT, weaning weight. These are ranked according to weaning weight. So that ram at the top, 3.8 pounds, or possibly it's kilograms probably. Accuracy of 74, that's pretty decent. But that's the trait leader. If you go down a couple of columns, like the one, two, three, four, fifth column where it says USA mat. That's actually a selection index, which I'll show you a little bit later. But this is the highest ranking that ran with the highest breeding value. So if I was really interested in improving, again, let's say this is polypase, then I might want to get a ram out of that flock. Again, uh, this is long term. NSIP was started in 1986. You see the graph there with the blue line. 
the data stops at 2008. This is for the Suffolk breed. This is for 120 day weight, which is basically a post weaning weight. Wean at 60 days, so that's 60 to 120 day weight. You can see over time the progress that's been made on, um, on EPDs. Remember, they're two times the estimated breeding value. The table at the bottom gives an example. Well, this was a study that was done gosh, about 13 years ago. It compared Suffolk rams that were in the National Sheep Improvement Program, those that were not. And you could see the differences in those lambs. At 120 days of age, there was basically a four pound difference in those lambs, in those rams. So think about when prices, if prices are $1.50 um, a pound, and I've got an extra four pounds. That's six dollars. I got a flock of a hundred. You know, you start doing the math. It starts to put dollars in your pocket. If you go up to the small table where we see Holstein cattle, Angus cattle, and Suffolk sheep, here we're comparing the annual progress of NSIP in the Suffolk breed for that 120 day wait. Holstein cattle over so many years you'd see a similar trend that you see for the Suffolk 120 day weight. The annual progress is about 0.8 percent, so not quite 1 percent. Holstein cattle are the model. I mean, they show what this technology can do. They show what this technology can do. And keep in mind, they had AI to assist in making genetic improvements. Angus cattle, looking at yearling weight, again, over a similar period of time, would show a very similar trend and they made a progress of about a half a percent a year on yearling weight. For this 120 day weight on Suffolk, it was a little bit less at 0.3 percent. If you look at some of the other data for some of the other sheep breeds, they're very consistent with the progress that's been made in some of the beef cattle breeds. So these are some of the things that we can expect. And again, it, you don't look at it in one year. You look at it, it's a long term commitment to make a better breed to make your breed be more relevant. If you have breeding values, if, if you participate in this, um, in this process, I, I happen to catch a, the question of the chat box that's very relevant for this slide. We can learn a lot from the mistakes that have been made in other industries. And one of the mistakes that have been made in other industries is single trait selection. Holstein cattle were selected almost exclusively for milk production. We know other traits are related either genetically or environmentally. I mentioned I think in an earlier presentation that the beef cattle industry when they selected strictly for yearling weight, they got increased birth weights and they had a lot of trouble delivering calves. We're relatively new at this. Goats haven't even started, meat goats. We never want to select for one trait. Never. There'll be undesirable consequences. We advocate balance selection, selection indexes. And I'm going to show you some of the selection indexes that NSIP and Land Plan have come up with. You can also make your own index. I've got one there at the bottom, my index. I've said 33% of the value of number lambs weaned, 33% weaning weight, and 33% fecal egg count. I just pulled that out of the air. But you can create your own selection index. And even if you don't make an index, but you look at multiple traits, you're going to say, well, I'm going to look for the highest weaning weight but I'm going to make sure I don't give up post weeding weight or I'm going to make sure it still has a good fecal lay count. You don't have an official index, but you're kind of doing the same thing. These are some of the indexes that have been created by NSIP and Land Plan. And they're primarily profitability indexes. The idea is weighting these traits according to their relevance to profitability. We have a Western Range Index because a production system in the Western Range with fine wool sheep is very different than a farm flock that has polypays or katahdins. So we see different indexes. They look pretty complicated. They really do. I understand that. 
but a lot of uh, uh, number crunching and a lot of work has gone into creating these indexes. And a couple of slides ago, I showed you that ram that had an index of 113 for maternal breeds. It would have been calculated. This is the basis that it, that it was used for. They have a um, number three is actually a lamb plan index. It's called Carcass Plus. It's for terminal sire breeds. Again, the Suffolk, the Texel, the Hampshire. Uh, it is used in this country. It is used in this country. And then number four is a brand new index that they've incorporated. It still has some of the same things the Carcass Plus index has, but it's got fecal egg counts, you know, looking at that as well. It's got birth weight in there, so it's, it's brought a few more things in there. But these are just, and, and you can use them and have and, and not have to calculate your own and, and understand how much effort and work has gone into these, again, putting the right emphasis on traits from an economic or profitability standpoint. All that's about sheep, right? Lamb, 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 plan, lamb, plan, lamb, plan. There is a kid plan. But what about meat goats? Previously, and it's been at least five years or more, boar goat breeders participated in NSIP. They called it BEGIN the Boar Goat Improvement Network. So they were starting to put data and starting to do it through NSIP. But I don't believe they're doing it anymore. The Kiko breeders had started. And there was some data put into that. And that data actually has been migrated to Land Plan. But um, since the Kiko breeders got started, they, that ball kind of got dropped. But the reality is that if you're a meat goat producer, this is available to you. This is out there, and this is powerful. And if we really want to improve meat goats, if we want to improve the boar goat breed, we want to improve the Kiko breed, we want to make meat goats profitable in this country, this is something we need to embrace. It really is. And I've kind of really, with our buck test being predominantly Kiko, I'd really like to try to kind of start getting producers motivated to, to start participating in NSIP because it's not one producer we need. We need a network of producers because, again, there has to be that genetic connection in order to get valuable data, in order to get higher accuracy figures. So it's there. The meat goats would be part of land plan, not kid plan. There must be an agreement with just land plan. Uh, the terminology would say lamb, you, and ram, but it would be the same. And really, when you think about meat goats, they're really the traits that we're interested in are not different from the traits that we're interested in sheep. You know, the weight traits, the carcass traits, the maternal traits, the fecal egg counts. If I was a Kiko breeder or involved in the Kiko Association, this is something I would run with because we could start documenting that Kikos are superior for fecal egg count. Let's say for argumentative purposes they are. This is going to help promote, sell that breed, export that breed. The boar goats, it's just as important. You need a method to identify the superior uh, boar goats in this country. So they're not a part of it. Meat goats are not a part of it, but they certainly can be. And I would encourage people to start considering it. If this is something that interests you, basically you send, you, you go to the website, nsip.org, I think it is. You send an enrollment form, fill the enrollment form out, send it to NSIP. The enrollment fee depends on the size of the flock. Uh, you have to pay an extra 25 bucks if you got a, uh, multiple breeds. Uh, you install the software on your computer, you enter the data, you get the data back. NSIP has the right, again, to publish the trait leaders, the uh, but the young sire potentials, stuff like that. The fee is basically $2. Every time it, a new animal goes in, it's $2. So those are basically what the fees are. I think pretty much any breed can participate. I think to get goats back in wouldn't take much, but I think you'd, we'd, have to, um, we'd have to be in contact with the, the leadership here to get goats back in, but I don't think it'd be hard at all. But right now, I think the other, breed, other breeds of sheep can pretty well uh, participate. Under NSIP, they really couldn't because you had to have a breed coordinator. So as an individual breeder, regardless of, of whether other people participate, 
you can get flock EPDs. But to get the true power of the system, we need multiple flocks and we need that, those genetic connections. Where we do have genetic evaluation in the goat industry is dairy goats. And dairy goats have a longer history and probably a greater success than any meat sheep or, or wool sheep. And that's because they fit in with dairy cattle. The evaluation is done by the Animal Improvement Programs Laboratory, which is part of USDA. And they partner with various industry organizations, uh, in the case of goats, the American Dairy Goat Association. There were 15,357 does from 446 herds in 41 states enrolled as of the first of the year. I'm sure that's more than we have sheep in an SIP program. I think there's about seven herds in Maryland. So this is where goats are definitely ahead of sheep. The genetic evaluation of dairy goats incorporates both production records, which is collected by DHI, which is Dairy Herd Improvement. It also incorporates linear appraisal and pedigree records from the American Dairy Goat Association. So we look on the production side, we get the yield of milk, fat, protein, and we get the percentages, you know, milk production. But then linear appraisal is basically type evaluation, and they look at 13 different traits. So obviously this, this is a, a more subjective part of it. And then there's a final score. And this is done by the American Dairy Goat Association. The dairy evaluation uses different terms, but it, again, it's the same technology. It's, it's the same thing. Instead of EBV, EPD, we have PTA and ETA and PTI, predicted transmitting ability. So the average genetic value that an animal transmits to his offspring. The second one is an estimate of the transmission of the genetic merit to the offspring. It's based on both the sire and the dam. And then they have their own indexes. We have a production index, which, again, we have to make adjustments for milk production just like we do for, for some of our weight traits. So they have milk production plus that final linear appraisal score. And you can do an index that puts twice as much emphasis on production or twice as much emphasis on type. So different acronyms, but the same technology. It's doing the same thing. Instead of calling it accuracy, they call it reliability. Again, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Milk product, again, everything is by, is always by breed. Uh, if you go to the agdagenetics.org, and I know you can't see this graphic very well, but it's, uh, it's got tremendous uh, search capability of looking for, looking by pedigree, looking by index, looking by trait, and of course all sortable by breed. So if you're a dairy goat producer, I would encourage you to visit this website and get lost in it and see what's available. There's also a lot of, um, a lot, again, a lot of reading, reading material. If you want to, well, how do I use this data? All that stuff can be found. It's too much to, to cover tonight in terms of the specifics of it. But in the dairy goat uh, world, we've, we're, uh, we've got excellent data. We really do. I'm going to change gears for the last part of uh, tonight's presentation and talk about genomics. Basically, the genome is an organism's, is the complete genetic makeup of an organism. The sheep genome is more than 90% mapped. Probably it's close to 100%. And the reason it's that close is they use the genomes of related species and even people kind of to fill in the gaps. So the sheep genome is about 90% the same as cattle. So there's not really that many gaps left in, in the map. And there's tons of websites related to, to um, genomes, sheep genomes, if you want to learn more. The significant thing that, that happened in the sheep industry that hasn't happened with goats yet is what you see up there, it says ovine NSA, N, S, NP50. This is really, without going into what it is, and I'm not even sure specifically how it works, but this technology allows 
researchers to find the genetic variation on the genome. It, it, it took us to the next level. Before, and we'll, go, we'll look at some of the different traits, it would have been almost impossible without a technology like this. And so they can do a lot more. We don't have that with the goats. In fact, the mapping of the goats is much less advanced. But again, with its similarity to the sheep genome, um, it shouldn't be that hard. But it's not nearly as, as, uh, as advanced as the sheep. And then the sheep, keep in mind, is going to be light years behind our bigger industries. But a lot of progress has been made in mapping the genome. If you remember the very first slide I showed tonight when I talked about marker-assisted selection, I talked about having different kind of traits. We have, again, single gene traits. Actually, I think that's supposed to say, yeah, single gene effects. If you remember back to, I think, our first presentation where I talked about, you know, qualitative traits, certain things are are controlled by one gene and the offspring receives an allele from both of his parents and that determines the expression of that trait. These weren't that hard to figure out. You could do it with breedings and, and pedigree analysis. And some examples of these traits is spider lamb disease and we've that's come up before in this in uh, our series here. Hairy lamb syndrome which has been uh, something that's happened within the last few years with the Southdown breed. Instead of being woolly, they're hairy. It's all right to be hairy if you're a Catan, but you're not supposed to be hairy if you're a, a uh, Southdown. Again, simple inheritance. One of the few things they did figure out on the goat genome was the polled intersex condition. When we breed a polled goat to a polled goat, we increase the probability that the offspring will be hermaphrodites or have both sexual organs. Horns, again, a trait that's very simply inherited. It's not just one gene, it's usually multiple genes, but it wasn't that hard basically to, to know how that's controlled. Uh, the Calipigi gene, very similar to number six, muscular hypertrophy. Calipigi is just, was lambs with extreme muscling, and they were, again, fairly easy compared to what we face nowadays to identify where that was. Interesting enough, calipigi actually means beautiful buttocks. So these lambs had very large legs. So those were kind of the first genes or the first traits that we quote mapped. We figured out where they were and it was done primarily through what they call genetic linkage, looking at pedigrees, things like that. Once we get away from qualitative traits, we have all of our quantitative traits, which means two or more genes control that trait. Now, of course, some traits, multiple genes control the trait, but they're not, you know, many, many, many. Or there are some major genes that have large effects on that trait. And if you see the, the list of examples there, um, these are traits that have been discovered. Again, a lot of it through genetic linkage. But these were major genes that affected a quantitative trait. One of the very first ones was uh, there's a breed of there's merino sheep, and they determined that the Barula strain of the merino sheep had a very high reproductive rate. And they determined that the ovulation rate in these Barula merinos was controlled by a major gene. The Inverdale fecundity, same thing, only that was Romneys in New Zealand. Myostatin is basically uh, the heavy muscle gene in the Texel sheep. In New Zealand, they have identified major genes that affect foot rot resistance and cold tolerance. Qualitative tra quantitative traits, but major gene effects. Of course, scrapey resistance. You know, we've, we've, we've figured out where that's controlled. And very recently, within the last year, resistance to OPP. OPP stands for ovine progressive pneumonia. CAE in goats is, is a similar slow virus, but this can be a real, um, this is a great thing for the sheep industry because OPP is felt to have a significant effect on production. The last column is the hard ones. This is the traits 
where we have many, many genes and they have very small individual effects. Of course, these are all the important ones. Reproduction, growth, milk production, carcass, disease resistance. These are the, these are the difficult ones. These are the ones especially that we need that chip, the SNP50. That SNP actually stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. That's what it means. But that chip enables us to be able to look at regions on the genome and start to figure some of this out. But in no way is it easy. You know, figuring out spider lamb disease was easy from a genetic standpoint. And very important. Don't get me wrong, very important. But these other traits, these production type traits, are much more difficult, much more involved for us to figure out, for the scientists to figure out. So what do we have available now in terms of this technology? Well, we already have a number of DNA tests that we can do on our sheep and goats, genomic-based diagnostic tests. A lot of people, including myself, have been testing for scraping resistance. And my next slide, I'm going to give you an example of that. A lot of our Suffolk breeders and um, other similar breeds can test for spider lamb syndrome. Again, very simply inherited. The hairy lamb syndrome with the Southtown breed can be tested. And OPP, that's, again, the one that's uh, most recently available. So I don't care if you have one sheep or a thousand sheep. These, this technology is available to you. From the goat standpoint, other than determining parentage and breed, uh, the primary test that we have available is one called Alpha S1 casein. And I'm gonna, again, I'm going to talk about what that one is. And that one's um, become significant not only for, the, for dairy goat producers, but also for meat goat producers. So these are available to us. Sometimes there's uh, certified labs. Uh, sometimes there's individual labs that do the testing. And if you're interested in any of these and you want and not sure where you can get them tested, just um, drop me an email or drop Jeff an email and we can tell you where you can get them tested. Okay, so let's just look at a couple of examples. The one most widely used in the sheep business is scrapey resistance. Scrapey, I think everybody's familiar with, kind of the mad cow, uh, the sheep version of mad cow disease. We have figured out, or scientists figured out, that scrapie is certainly not a genetic disease, but whether an animal will get it uh, is controlled by genetics. So the gene that is responsible for affecting scrapie resistance, there's three codons that affect that, the 171, 154, and 136. In the United States, and this may well be true of Canada as well, codon 171 is the major determinant of scrapie susceptibility or resistance in the U.S. So most of us, we test for codon 171. I think I pay $12 for the test. I put the blood on a little card and I mail it. A lot of uh, RAM tests, uh, a lot of places will automatically test for scrapie resistance. The R gene is resistant and the Q gene is susceptible. So you've got three possible genotypes. And this is what you'll get when you send the blood or the blood card in. You'll your results will say RRQR or QQ. So if you have an RR ram, that ram is resistant to scrapie. When it is bred, it will transmit an R gene to all of its offspring. All of its offspring will be resistant to scrapie. Q, the QR genotype is rarely susceptible to scrapie. Basically, we consider it to be resistant to scrapie. However, if your ram is QR, half of his offspring will have an R gene resistant and half of his offspring will have a Q gene susceptible. And of course a QQ is susceptible and every offspring that that ram sires will pass on that Q gene. If I'm a purebred breeder, this is pretty important to me. If I'm a commercial breeder, probably not so important to me. Probably not so important to me. I know in my own selection program, I want RR rams, but if I have a really good QQU, I won't get rid of her. But I only use RR rams. Switching to the goats, alpha S1 casein is one of the four casein proteins found in goat's milk and is the most important of the four for cheese making. So dairy goat producers know, have known that this is a trait that they want. 
because they're going to get better cheese production. Interestingly enough, the I believe it's the American Kiko Association now encourages its members to test for this gene. Because if it makes good cheese, it makes good milk, which should make the kids grow better. So we want the same quality in a meat goat dough that we want in a dairy goat if we're making cheese. I may not be making cheese. I may have a different thing. The variance that you can get in, um, in this gene, if, you, if the kid inherits the A or B, that's a high content of the casein, and an E, F, or N is a low amount. If they get a gene from each of those two groups, they're going to be intermediate. And I'm going to be the first one not to claim to be an expert on this. I'm kind of still learning about it. Like I said, I found it real interesting that the, the Kiko, a meat goat breed, is interested in it. And it makes a lot of sense to me. I know my own, I've probably indicated to you before that one of the reasons I'm introducing the Lacone breed to my Katahdin flock is not only because it's a bigger milk producer, but it's the dairy sheep that has the highest milk fat. Again, more milk fat, more milk protein, better milk, better growth, higher weaning weights. That's kind of the theory. If I'm making cheese, again, though, those are very important traits. I believe it's the University of California, Davis, which does the testing, and you can learn a lot more about it um, on their website. Because, like, again, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on it. Kind of to, it's kind of to wrap things up a little bit, where do we stand, or, or what's the role of genomics in the U.S. sheep and goat industry? Well, we've got severe limitations. We have those tests that, that I just showed you, and maybe we'll have more of those in years to come. And they're most likely to be, you know, genetic defects or traits in which there's a major gene identified. Because the reality is, even though both the sheep and goat genome are mapped fairly far along for the goats, not for the sheep, not quite as much in the goats, it's, it is less advanced. There's a lot less money available for sheep research and especially goat research. Most people, and, and, and the participants in, the, in our webinar here are a perfect example, most of us are small producers. Many are limited resource and not likely to spend, you know, money for the testing or, or money to, to go into uh, the evaluation programs. So it's a small industry and small producers. The things that I think are even more significant are we just don't have a lot of performance tested animals, even within our small industry. Again, I don't think we have anywhere near the number of meat sheep that we have dairy goats. And, and the dairy goat industry can be very proud of, of the commitment to that evaluation program. We need more performance tested animals. It goes hand in hand with the genomics. Because the genomics has to be related to our, our other evaluation programs. They go hand in hand. They support each other. So we need a lot of performance tested animals in different breeds. A lot of work is going to continue to be done in countries like Australia and New Zealand and other major countries that have large sheep industries. But what they determine doesn't necessarily apply to another country and another breed. I'll give you a couple of examples. The foot rot DNA test. You know, they'd love to use that in the UK, in England, because foot rot's a major problem in a wet climate like the UK, and they're basically finding that it's not applicable to the UK. Different, different place, different genetics. When they've looked at uh, parasite resistance, different studies, different places, different breeds, they're finding different genes. Okay? So I think what we're going to have in this country is, again, I think we're going to primarily be in those first two columns where we have, we're able to test for a single trait or a trait that has a major gene effect. And in addition to the ones you already see, I think the ones in particular that may become available will be things that relate to carcass muscling, I think. You know, the, they're doing a lot in the myostatin gene with the Texel, you know, things like that. Getting to that third column is where um, it's going to be tough. 
again, the limitation on funding, the limitation on, on numbers and participation in national evaluation programs. Those are going to be tough. And the work that they do in other countries with, with larger number of animals, you know, there's going to be some application, but it's not always going to be quite the same. I look at a lot of, uh, again, particularly that third column to be in the distant future. They're probably going to figure out things that we can't even fathom right now. Like before they came up with that, that chip that makes looking at the genome a lot easier, looking at places on the genome a lot more practical and at a reasonable cost, they probably ha hadn't envisioned that. So it's hard to know what's in the future. But I'll get back to kind of to our earlier presentations is we've got tools already that we don't even use. You know, we'll embrace the testing for things like the milk casein and the scrapie resistance and if they come up with one for fart rot or, you know, we'll embrace those and, and they'll be useful. But we have a lot of tools. We have tools right now that we don't use to make improvement. The first one's the simple on-farm evaluation. You know, are you doing adjusted weaning weights? If you're a terminal sire breed, are you doing post-weaning weights? Are you looking at parasite resistance? Do you consign bucks or rams to a performance test? If you're a big enough a purebred producer or a committed enough purebred producer, you know, you have the NSIP and the lamb plan, uh, sheep and meat goats, and of course the dairy goats has a pretty well-established program. If you don't do number three, buy your breeding stock from the people that do. Otherwise, you have to ask yourself, if you're not buying a ram or buck based on number one, two, or three, what on earth are you buying him on? How are you choosing that he has any genetic value whatsoever if you don't have one, two, or three? How do you know? So we've got tools out there now that we can use. And hopefully, again, there'll be more opportunity to test for single traits that can have a big impact. You know, do I think there's going to be a test for parasite resistance where I just test and get A or B? No, I don't ever think that's going to happen. But that's certainly a trait they're looking at. Definitely parasite resistance. WVU's doing some work with the St. Croix. The lead institution is probably in Kenya, where we have one of the most parasite-resistant breeds in the world, the Red Maasai. So, you know, a lot of countries are doing a lot of, a lot of different things. And with that, I will conclude. I want to thank you for participating in our series. I would ask that um, if you've not already done so, to please join the listserv because that's the only way I can follow up with people.